In section 6.2, we're going to get into uh, describing the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom, and we're going to use the Rydberg equation to calculate energies of light emitted or absorbed by hydrogen atoms. So let's think about what Niels Bohr did. So um, he eventually was able to come up with some explanation for the uh, spectra of hydrogen. Um, his work was able to convince scientists to abandon classical physics and spurred on the development of modern quantum mechanics. What did he say? He said that atoms consisted of tiny dense nuclei surrounded by lighter and even tinier electrons continually moving around the nucleus. So we started to, we already kind of had this idea, right? This classical mechanical description of the atom is incomplete. Since an electron moving in an elliptical orbit, so like in some sort of circle, like the moon moving around the Earth, it, it would be accelerating. And if it is accelerating and it does have a charge, well, an accelerating charge is going to emit electromagnetic radiation. That is something that we know from physics. If it's emitting radiation, then it's losing energy. If it's losing energy, then the orbit should get smaller and smaller until eventually it hits the nucleus, much like a satellite that's slowly uh, coming closer and closer to the Earth until eventually it doesn't have a stable orbit anymore and it comes in to our atmosphere and hits the planet, right? Um, so he attempted to resolve this atomic paradox by ignoring classical electromagnetism's prediction that the orbiting electron and hydrogen would continuously emit light. So he said it's not going to shoot off light. Um, instead, what's going to happen is uh, he's, he's bringing in a lot of ideas from Planck's about quantization and the idea that the light consists of photons, and he starts to assume that the electron orbiting the nucleus would not normally emit any radiation. Rather, the electron emits or absorbs a photon if moved to a different orbit. So basically, he's saying that electrons have set orbits, and when they move between them, this is accompanied by the absorption or emission of a photon. The energy absorbed or emitted would reflect differences in the orbital energies according to this equation. So we have the change in energy is going to be equal to the final energy of the electron minus the initial energy of the electron. We already saw this with temperature and enthalpy. We were used to that kind of mathematical form. That's going to be equal to H times nu, like Planck said. Again, we can rewrite that in terms of wavelengths. Um, and we're going to assume here that there are only discrete values for delta E, that there's only some delta E's that are permissible. And he came up with this expression for that, where he says that the energy value that, that are possible are all going to be some constant divided by n squared. They're always going to be uh, negative in this scenario. Um, and then he actually, instead of just saying, well, the k value is this, he started to develop uh, an idea of what this k value, where it was coming from. So he had some basic fundamental constants, such as the electron's mass, its charge, Planck's constant, these all comprise K. So he gave us some idea where that K value was coming from, uh, as opposed to like Rydberg or uh, Balmer. <laughs> and it's also consistent with what we were seeing all, already. So if we look at delta K or delta E, right? So if we take this E minus some other E, then we get an expression that looks like this. And if we rearrange that expression, we get something that looks like this. And if we set, if we look at K divided by HC, we say, well, that is actually Rydberg's equation. So this theory that gives us a little bit more insight into what is happening is consistent with what we already know to be true for the hydrogen atom. 
And this gave scientists the idea that maybe uh, Bohr was onto something here. So I want you guys to start to picture what it is I'm saying here. So if you look here, this is the idea of the quantization of energy levels. So what we're saying is that there are permissible energy levels and there are nothing in between those energy levels. So you could have a, a bottom energy level here that is uh, negative 2.8. 1, 8 times 10 to the negative 18, right? You could have a higher energy level here, a higher energy level here, on and on and on, but you can't have anything in between them. And this is going to be specific for uh, different elements. So this, for instance, are the permissible energy levels that hydrogen can have. All right, so we've got some language to talk about here. So um, one fundamental idea that we have from the laws of physics is that matter is most stable when it has the lowest possible energy. So when an electron is in this lowest energy orbit, the atom is said to be in its ground state. If the atom receives energy from an outside source, it is possible for the electron to move to an orbit with a higher n value, and this is going to be an excited state. I think you guys have noticed that as I've been talking through this, I'm talking about some exciting electrons, and that is what happens when an electron moves from a lower energy state to a higher excited state. So what makes it move from one orbit to another? That is when an atom absorbs energy in the form of a photon. Um, the electron moves from an orbit with lower n value to a higher n value. When an electron falls from an orbit with a higher n value to a lower n, uh, n value, it's going to uh, emit a photon. And since delta E can only be discrete values, the photon absorbed or emitted can only have a wavelength with a discrete value. It's not going to be continuous. This explained the line spectra that they started to see for the hydrogen atom. So let's see what exactly, let's see if we can picture that. So what they're saying is uh, if this is the ground state, of the hydrogen atom, it can be excited to this first uh, n equals 2 state. It could go past that to n equals 3 or n equals 4. Okay, Each of these is going to involve um, absorbing a photon of a different energy, a different frequency. If it was at any one of these states, say it was already at n equals 2, it can still go up to any of the other excited states. And it can also fall from one of these excited states down to each one. Each of these um, would, rep would be accompanied by the emission of a photon of a different frequency, each having different energy values. It doesn't have to fall all the way back down to the ground state either. And you can see that there is a... Okay, so let's use the Bohr model to perform a calculation on the absorption of a photon. Uh, so what is the energy in joules and the wavelength in meters of the line in the spectrum of hydrogen that represents the movement of an electron from Bohr orbit with n equals 4 to the orbit with n equals 6? In what part of the electromagnetic spectrum do we find this radiation? Okay, so in this case, the electron starts out with n equals 4. So n1, this first guy here, is going to be a 4. And it comes to rest in n equals 6. So n2 here is going to be 6. Um, the difference in energy between the two states is given by the, this expression, and we got our k value here of 2.179 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. We'll plug him in there. Plugging in this value, we get the k value times 1 over 4 squared, 1 uh, 1 16th minus 1 over 6 squared, 136, 
we see that this is going to be a positive value and we wind up getting 7.566 simpson to negative 20 joules. This energy difference is positive, indicating that the photon enters the system. To excite the electron from the n equals 4 orbit up to the n equals 6 orbit. The wavelength of this photon, we're going to use this equation down here. So solving that for the wavelength lambda, we get h times c divided by that energy value. We input the Planck constant. We input the uh, speed of light here. We see that the seconds are going to cancel here. The joules cancel here, and we wind up being in meters. And if we go back to the spectrum that we saw before, we would see that that wavelength corresponds to the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So Bohr's model has some limitations. It was unable to extend his theory to the next simplest atom, helium, so it only works for uh, hydrogen. Um, it does not account for electron-electron interactions. It can't handle those types of interactions. Um, and it was still based on classical mechanics notion of precise orbits. And we'll see exactly what precise orbits means in a little bit here. Um, the Bohr model does introduce several important features of all models used to describe the distribution of electrons. Uh, so it was a move forward. The energies of the electrons in an atom are quantized. They're described by quantum numbers. Integers numbers having only specific allowed values and used to characterize the arrangements of electrons in an atom. An electron's energy increases with increasing distance from the nucleus. The discrete energies, lines, and the spectra of elements result from these quantized uh, energies. Um, Bohr won a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1922 for his contributions. It became clear to most physicists at the time that the classical theories that worked so well in the macroscopic wor world were fundamentally flawed and could not be extended down into the microscopic domains. Um, and uh, a proper model of quantum mechanics was later developed that superseded the classical mechanics.